today Professor Roger Narayan, uh, who is visiting New Zealand as a Fulbright specialist. So he's on, on his way to Christchurch, and we, we've been very lucky to grab him while he's uh, passing through Auckland. So uh, Dr. Narayan um, has an MD and a PhD um, from North Carolina State University. And he is now a, a joint professor of uh, biomedical engineering at the University of North Carolina and the North Carolina State University. So his uh, research specialty is in um, uh, laser-based attitude manufacturing, um, and he's going to talk to us about its applications uh, in um, biomedical uh, materials. Thanks for the kind introduction, and thanks to uh, Dustin and the whole department for uh, hosting me and for, the note for uh, introducing me. Um, so what I'll do this afternoon is to give some overview of additive manufacturing and uh, give some examples of how we use laser-based techniques to perform additive manufacturing in the past decade or so. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the people at uh, NC State and in other institutions, including the Laser Dentro in Hanover, to the uh, and many other institutions that have uh, collaborated on this work and made it possible. I also want to thank the funding agencies in the United States, including the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and some parts of the Department of Defense. And so uh, the idea behind uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing is that you have, over the past two or three decades, the ability to use this layer-by-layer -layer manufacturing technique to, to create structures that have been very difficult to produce via conventional means. It has a lot of different uh, part utility for uh, medical applications. You have the ability to make a device quickly from a computer design. You can perfect designs and iterate them very quickly. Now you're seeing more and more use of 3D printing to make the final usable part. It's about one third of the uses of 3D printing and that, that proportion is only growing. So we're seeing that you really have to uh, optimize the material properties much more than you had to in the past when uh, molding was the, the typical application. So you have, in terms of the uh, unique attributes, they include shape complexity, material complexity, the ability to create hierarchical features, the ability to incorporate multiple functions. And this is a slide from David Rosen at Georgia Tech. Um, in terms of where this is done, it's actually a global phenomenon. You can see here the global pie. You have the U.S. doing a lot of additive manufacturing, but it's also been a major focus of activity in Asia and in Europe. If you look at the uh, applications of additive manufacturing, the largest uh, sector is consumer products, about one quarter of the uses, but medical is 10%. So medical is a significant uh, proportion of what people are using uh, 3D printing for. If you look at the sort of charts you see, this is the, the total market for our materials, printers, and parts. You can see here is this uh, large upward tick uh, into the billions of dollars. And what we're seeing is that it's not just uh, buying a printer, but it's also buying the materials that is a, a challenge. So it is, it is um, not just a manufacturing issue. I think it's a really a material science issue. And, that, and I'm, as a material scientist, very interested in developing new materials for additive manufacturing. If you look at just the medical space, it also shows us a large upward tick over time in terms of the growth of, of the medical additive manufacturing market, including prosthetics, orthotic, worn devices, and, and medical modeling. Uh, but you're seeing more and more new types of devices coming out of uh, the 3D printing space. And in terms of the 3D printing techniques, there it's, it's basically uh, all the methods available for joining together material in a layer by layer manner to create a 3D part. So you can uh, join together filaments, uh, create roads of filaments, and join them together in order to create a 3D part. This is known as fused deposition modeling. You can use inkjet printing, um, something like uh, the, your Epson or your Hewlett Packard printer. You can use uh, laser sintering or laser melting to join together polymers or metals. And you can use photopolymerization. And I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about, about the idea of selectively hardening a liquid um, in, in, a, in using that uh, selective hardening in order to create a three-dimensional structure. Uh, one of the things that people think when they think about uh, photopolymerization-based additive manufacturing is that it is 
an approach that only creates small scale parts. But in fact, we've seen demonstrations in the US of making human sized, large scale parts, and it's just a matter of having the right hardware, the right apparatus in order to do the manufacturing. So if you look at the 3D printing techniques, and this is just a very brief overview, the idea here is that you do have basically a type of feedstock, whether it be a liquid, a powder, a filament, or a solid sheet. You have to join it together with some sort of form of energy, whether it be light, electron beam, thermal energy, or chemical changes. And that gives us the, the, the variety of printing technologies uh, that are available. And so you really do have a, a, a kind of a schema here for, for what is available in terms of uh, 3D printing technologies. And we've had innovations in 3D printing technologies over the past two, two to three decades now. And, and I, th I think uh, there is still growth uh, in that area of developing new types of 3D printing techniques. 3D printing can involve all the same classes of materials we've been studying in material science for, for decades, hundreds of years, millennia, so natural materials, polymers, metals, ceramics, all the same uh, classes of materials we've been studying for a long period of time and developing know-how are, are all uh, the same, uh, same know-how can be applied to 3D printing. And if you look at uh, the, the sectors in which uh, 3D printing is used, what we see is that each sector can use a kind of focus on a different type of printing technology. So in the medical space, you have the application of metals and, and polymers. And so you really the, the techniques for, for sintering or melting metals and polymers or photopolymerization of polymers are the, the major uh, topics that we consider and, and the focus areas. And, and in terms of uh, the, the classes uh, of polymers and metals, it really uh, is, it are the same sort of uh, technical polymers and metals that we've been studying and utilizing in, in device fabrication for decades now. So things like nylon, peak, uh, stainless steel, titanium, cobalt chrome, and various forms of ceramics. So we we're, we're basically can take all of our know-how from decades and apply it to this new technology. When we think about medical additive manufacturing, we think, well, maybe that's something far in the future. Um, it, it seems like something that isn't really readily implemented or, or would take a large amount of time before we can put it into the market. And that truly is not the case. In fact, in the United States, we have this product called Invisalign, which is a, a dental appliance that straightens the teeth. The, the master structures that are used to create the, the parts that are inserted in the mouth are created through photopolymerization based additive manufacturing. So we have a, a very successful commercial technology that would not be possible without photopolymerization based additive manufacturing. And, and this is just one example of a very highly successful business. And we're seeing more and more customized orthotic devices and prosthetic devices that are, are coming into a use. And in fact, if you look this is just an example of the Invisalign process, but as you can see here, the, the master structures are created through stereolithography apparatus, and in fact, uh, this is uh, something which is being done in multiple plants in the U.S. and in other countries. There are issues and concerns about additive manufacturing that I'll very briefly touch on. Now, one of them is the idea of energy savings. So, People have in the additive manufacturing community felt that potentially you can reduce energy costs by the selective uh, processing of material. And, and this could be true. So if you use local materials, if you are creating designs that save a lot of material in the final design that you, wouldn't, uh, you otherwise would have to make a much bulkier part, or if you can make locally Potentially, you can reduce costs quite a bit as compared to conventional manufacturing. So we, we do have this argument out there that this is a, an energy-saving approach. But you do have a, an alternative philosophy. And that's the one that says, well, you're actually using feedstock materials that have been prepared specifically for this purpose. They have embedded energy. You actually do have to use directed energy in order to polymerize or sinter or melt materials. and so. This is considered to be somewhat uh, a, a topic up in the air. And so um, 
There are ways of trying to reduce uh, the cost. One of the ways is by recycling the feedstock material that's unused in the original 3D printing technique. And so you have examples with selective laser sintering where you can perhaps uh, recycle feedstock material that was not used in, a, in an earlier process and try to reuse it. Um, and this can uh, reduce costs, but cost is a major stumbling block that can prevent um, the commercial use of 3D printing. So, um, one second here, I think I need to come through to here. Um, so, one of the things that we see, and this is a very hard slide to read, um, but the purpose of, the, of showing this slide is that the resolution of 3D printing is really in the micro scale regime for the most part. And the, I think the innovation in 3D printing that can allow it to make more innovative medical product is to reduce this minimum feature size down below one micrometer or, or in, and into the sub-micrometer regime. And so uh, kind of with that overview of 3D printing technologies, uh, where they're used, what their limitations are uh, in kind of just uh, 10 minutes, now I'll, I'll kind of show you a little bit about how I got into uh, 3D printing and where I see 3D printing of polymers going. Um, so I actually started out as a thin films person and I, I um, decided to uh, start looking, I originally did my PhD thesis on 3D printing of um, ceramic thin films, but uh, there was a big problem um, in terms of some of the adhesion of these ceramic thin films because the the substrates of these uh, systems were metallic, they were much softer, and so that was kind of an insurmountable challenge. But I, I had all this uh, laser equipment, and so I actually decided, well, let me see if I can do something where I'm not making a, a super hard coating on a little bit softer surface. Let me start looking at how to make soft coatings, polymer coatings, using the same laser hardware. And so I uh, started uh, utilizing a technique that was pioneered by the um, Naval Research Lab in Washington uh, known as matrix-assisted pulse laser evaporation. And the idea there is that you take a frozen target containing a biomaterial of interest, um, you then uh, ablate it with a UV pulse at relatively low energy, the volatile solvent is uh, pumped away, and you can create biomaterial thin film coatings. And so, this was not, uh, sort of a way of building up material in a layer by layer manner of a biomaterial with a controlled film thickness. And, and it used a lot of the technology I'd, I'd been using to create diamond -like, like carbon thin films and titanium nitride thin films. So this is an example of what, what, what we would do. We would take a polymer, in this case a material that's used in, in drug delivery known as CPPSA. We'd mix into it a material known as gentamicin, which is an antimicrobial agent. And we could actually um, create a, a, a frozen target out of this. Um, and this is sort of the, some of the details. What we did is we put into a car, uh, copper target holder at 173 Kelvin, and we froze it with liquid nitrogen, and then ablated it with a very low fluence. And so by doing that, you could create these sort of um, drug-containing thin films, which was kind of interesting. Um, they ended up having a little bit of copper because we had to freeze this in a copper uh, holder. But at the same time, we were able to create some films that had some of the properties of the, of the drug. Um, the question we have is well, maybe the copper might have done something, but we've actually done subsequent studies with other, other um, drugs which, which show that the, the materials have antifungal activity and, and other types of activity. So it turns out we had this sort of approach for using a laser to start building up materials in a layer by layer manner. We th then also started looking at the, the sort of uniformity of these materials. You can see here you have these atomically smooth sort of uh, thin films. We also then saw that they, they were functional. Um, they, we were able to transfer biomaterials with a, a very um, good uh, correspondence between what we saw um, in terms of the functional components in the target and the functional components in the deposited film. We then decided uh, to kind of take this forward 
and, and look at a, a variation of this approach using the same hardware, um, but modified so that you could use it for cell printing. And so the previous technique was known as matrix-assisted pulse laser evaporation for printing polymer thin films. This technique is known as MAPLE, matrix-assisted pulse laser evaporation, direct right. So in this case, we are still using um, an excimer laser at very low fluence. And instead of ablating a target, having the volatile solvent uh, pumped out, and depositing a biomaterial, what we did is to use a laser at low fluence, uh, and then selectively uh, intra have that interact with a, a, a glass slide. And that glass slide uh, laser light interaction allowed us to selectively desorb materials uh, on the glass slide, like cells and biomaterials. They were, they were basically transferred from that glass slide onto the surface below. So this allowed you to take any biomaterial of interest, um, that could be bioceramic, a cell, spin coat it onto this glass slide, and then start transporting it and creating cell-containing patterns. And so this was kind of my first foray, foray into, into cell printing. Uh, and it was essentially taking some of the technologies that we've been using for ceramic thin films and changing around the hardware uh, and, and lowering the fluids, most importantly, and, and reutilizing them for cell manufacturing, biomaterial manufacturing. Here's an example of uh, this uh, glass uh, surface with laser ablated regions uh, uh, removed. So these are areas where the laser interacted with the glass slide, removed the material. You can see here patterns of the biomaterial. This is a hydroxy appetite. And you can see here that you have the ability to create kind of line features, dot features, squares, a variety of different features based on how you ablate that uh, glass slide. You can also modulate the microstructure by uh, controlling the solvent uh, and the, in terms of the solvent type and the solvent quantity. The transferred material is entirely crystalline. So this shows it's a transfer process and not an ablation process. If you ablated a ceramic at room temperature with an excimer laser, you get an amorphous calcium phosphate film. This is entirely crystalline. In fact, you don't see any sort of um, um, amorphous features uh, in this. You can also transfer uh, cells using the same approach. So this is an example of where we actually spin coated cells onto the glass and we're able to then start transferring them um, with laser at low fluence. These are MG63 osteoblast-like cells uh, that were uh, transferred uh, using the maple direct right technique. You also have the ability to, to mix cells and hydroxyapatite on, that were placed on this uh, glass and, and start ablating that and creating patterns of cells and hydroxyapatite, these osteoblast-like cells and hydroxyapatite. And, and the cells proliferated and, and uh, grew at rates that were similar to cells grown on polystyrene. So this shows that you have the ability um, to start doing cell printing with a, a laser you also have the ability to, uh, to kind of modulate the approach. Uh, there are things that we did uh, to try to do depth dependent uh, uh, light processing. So by increasing the laser fluence, you can push cells deeper and deeper into the substrate. We also could use a triazine polymer to attenuate the laser interaction with the cells. So we were able to reduce the laser fluence down to 0.07 joules per centimeter squared. Uh, these are neuroblast-like cells that were transferred. What you see here is that you have cells that were alive after transfer, and um, this is 48 hours after transfer. They remained viable, and in fact, they grew some axonal connections and, and started to uh, create sort of cell networks. So uh, that kind of got me interested in the concept of, of starting to print. Uh, and you could sort of do a quasi 3D structure with that approach. But I, I saw the value of, of laser-based additive manufacturing and wanted to see other approaches to try to reduce the features that could be obtained and get more precise features and, and get structures that had 
um, sort of uniformity at the micro scale and sub micro scale that, so that I could have uh, structures that you could create through, typically through uh, photolithographic techniques. I wanted to see if I could create something like we get with photolithography with additive manufacturing. And that was possible through uh, two photon polymerization. So I then started around 2005 uh, looking at two photon polymerization. I've spent the past uh, uh, 12 years uh, continuously looking at innovations in this approach and how to use it for various applications. This technique relies on multi-photon absorption. Um, so essentially if you bring in uh, two or more photons within a small volume over a short period of time, you can have interaction with that light analogous to interaction with light of a much higher energy. So that means that you can uh, focus IR laser pulses and photo initiate and polymerize a UV sensitive resin. There are a lot of UV sensitive resins out there. UV sensitive resins are used in microelectronics for, as photoresists been used that way for decades. So you can take those materials, materials used in reconstructive dentistry, a variety of different applications, and, and start polymerizing them, 3D printing them using two photon polymerization. This is an example of uh, features created out of polyethylene glycol diacrylate through two photon polymerization. What you see here is a, a minimum feature size of 200 nanometers. And in fact, here you can see with uh, the change of it at one parameter, laser power, you can get sort of a quasi linear increase in the dimension of the feature. You can change and, and modify programming parameters, optical parameters, um, laser parameters. Um, the material parameters in order to, to get the features of interest for the given application. The material that I spent a lot of time on back in 2005 was Ormeser materials. These are similar to materials used in reconstructive dentistry as an amalgam replacement. They have a very high elastic modulus, uh, around 6 gigapascals, so you have the ability to take a very stiff material and create sort of bone replacement sort of products or, or medical devices that have high stiffness. The material has very good biocompatibility. One of the things that we noticed, though, is that polyethylene glycol diacrylate or some of these other resins that are just as prepared through two-photon polymerization have poor biocompatibility. The reason for that was because the as-prepared material, as-polymerized material, had a lot of residual photo-initiator and monomer that was reducing the biocompatibility. The Ormeser, for some reason, did had less of that when it was polymerized, and so you had a high biocompatibility rate. But these other resins needed to have some sort of solution, some post-processing to make them suitably biocompatible. Uh, and so we started looking at ways of doing that. Um, one way that we did that was to age the materials in water um, in order to uh, get a more biocompatible resin. And another way we could do to solve that is by using uh, biocompatible photo initiators. And I'll show some examples of that in a few minutes. The original studies that we did were just to show that we can replicate shapes of, from a computer design into reality through two-photon polymerization. This is an example of a Lego-like sort of design that was recreated in Ormeser uh, using two-photon polymerization and was used to grow B35 neuroblast-like cells. And we continue to look at these Ormeser-like materials. Here's an example of a a zirconium oxide containing material that was polymerized with uh, Mitchler's ketone as a photo initiator, and it contains some uh, methacrylate groups. You can see here um, sort of features that can be created through this approach. These, you have a very good control, only in two dimensions, but you can see here in AFM, you have very good control over the third dimension. So you have the ability to create these structures that have really good topological control that can be used for cell growth studies. This is an example of a study involving bone marrow stromal cells. We looked at how cells align with the various features uh, that we created. Here's a more a recent study where we changed the dimensions of cylinders uh, that were created uh, out of an Ormeser material using two photon polymerization. The inner diameters of the cylinders were 250 micrometers, 200 micrometers, and 150 micrometers. What we saw is that you, when doing cell growth studies on these as polymerized systems, that we had, um, based on the cell type, differential behavior. So 
The adipose-derived stem cells had highest cell densities at the end of the study of day 21. Bone marrow stromal cells peaked at day 7 and then had lower cell um, numbers at day 21. We saw that if you had small-scale features, so uh, the, the uh, ring diameter of 150 micrometers, that in fact we had the highest amount of calcium deposition. So if you can have a higher relative surface area, just a physical manipulation of the surface, you can have larger amounts of kind of bio uh, activity, in this case calcium uh, deposition. So um, going back to the idea of biocompatibility, we, I mentioned earlier that there are ways of trying to improve the biocompatibility of resins that are polymerized with two-photon polymerization. As I mentioned before, you can take a resin, say in this case polyethylene glycol diacrylate, and we can age this material in water for seven days and we can dramatically improve the biocompatibility. So by, by aging this material in distilled water, you can kind of remove the monomers and the photoinitiators and, and you're getting a more biocompatible uh, surface and, and uh, a surface that, whose leachate is non-toxic. And in fact, what we saw when we did uh, a exam uh, material that contained polyethylene glycol diacrylate and Ergocure, which is a very toxic photo initiator, by aging the material in water for seven days, we had an absence of toxicity for the leachate. So that's one way of trying to solve this problem. Another way of trying to solve the issue of biocompatibility of two photon polymerization resins is to just use a more biocompatible material. That way you don't have to worry about post-processing, aging and for seven days, and, and things that may reduce the commercial viability of, of this sort of approach. So this is an example of where we took uh, polyethylene glycol diacrylate, polymerized with a combination of riboflavin and triethanolamine. So riboflavin is vitamin B2, and triethanolamine is a material that you find in soap and other consumer products. And in fact, this material has a uh, absorption peak uh, that's associated with a two-photon polymerization with an IR laser, a laser operating between 750 to 800 nanometers. We were able to create structures with very good feature-to-feature -feature uniformity out of polyethylene glycol diacrylate. You can see here a uh, very good cylinder to cylinder uniformity in these structures. And in fact, when we look at the genotoxicity, well, this is an example of, of SEM data. You can see here that, again, you have good uniformity from feature to feature within these structures. You do have some desiccation in the SEM that leads to some aberration in the features. But uh, the non desiccated version shows, as you can see here, uh, good feature to feature uniformity. When you look at um, the genotoxicity, what we see is that materials polymerized with a combination of riboflavin and triethanolamine have uh, less genotoxicity than a glass control. So you have essentially a non-toxic uh, material that's the feedstock for your two-photon polymerization, which gives us a lot of opportunities. Here you can see is some cell viability data. The cell viability um, for cells grown with riboflavin triethanolamine was similar to that of cell viability uh, associated with growth on glass. Here's an example of bovine aortic endothelial cells grown on the surfaces uh, of a PEG polyethylene glycol diacrylate uh, scaffold that contains this riboflavin and triethanolamine mixture. What we see here is a large number of living cells and almost no dead cells. So you have this kind of uh, biocompatible feedstock that allows us to um, sort of build out structures without having to do post-processing or aging in water or other uh, sort of time-consuming approaches. We also have the ability to process other classes of materials. Here's an example of an elastomer. Uh, so much uh, softer material than your Ormister materials. You can see here uh, again, fe good feature-to-feature -feature uniformity, again, the sort of replication of the cylinder mo motif in the polymerized structure. The hardness and the Young's modulus are much 
lower than those of Ormister materials. Uh, Ormister materials have Young's moduli around uh, six uh, gigapascal. Um, these materials have Young's moduli in the kilopascal regime, double digit kilopascal regime. So you have the ability to choose different classes of materials based on the end use application. Here you can see some examples of uh, structures, flat surfaces, or uh, two photon polymerization created 3D surfaces, and in comparisons of stem cell seeding. What we see is that you have the ability, as I mentioned earlier, to create these sort of high relative surface area structures and use those relatively high surface area structures to try to modulate biological activity. In this case, we look at protein content on the surface, and when you have a 3D surface, higher relative surface area, you have more uh, protein absorption. So this is sort of where I took um, a lot of the work in terms of two-photon polymerization for many years. And then I started looking at device applications. And one of the reasons for that is because in order to make a tissue engineering scaffold, you have to make something that covers a relatively large surface area. If your volumetric pixel is relatively small, it takes a long time to cover that uh, volume. Whereas if you can create a medical device that has a relatively small volume, you can polymerize the structure much more quickly, and you can create a functional device in minutes, and then uh, you can fully take advantage of the ability to polymerize at small length scales and create these fine scale features that are hard to create through conventional uh, photolithographic techniques. And so the, the sort of archetype or the example device that we spent uh, a lot of time on over the past decade is the microneedle. The microneedle is a small scale uh, hypodermic needle that goes into the skin and can deliver drugs into the skin or can uh, take uh, uh, interstitial fluid, the fluid at the surface of the skin, and, and examine it. So it has the ability of being this interface between a medical device and the body. And our sort of innovation at the beginning was that we could create these microneedles with very thick walls. So before the, the mid 2000s, it was difficult to create a microneedle with a thick wall because you're creating these through lithographic techniques and your the approach of creating a layer and then having to do uh, etchings techniques typically created a, a thin wall structure that would fracture in the skin. We were able to just build the structure from a computer model and create a wall thickness that, that we you know, could control by changing the, the computer diagram. We could change the aspect ratio. We could put unique features like uh, 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 openings at the base. You could create features like off-center geometry so that the tip entered at one side and the bore uh, was at an off-site location to deliver the drug. We eventually came across a material used in hearing aid shells. And if you look at a hearing aid shell, they're relatively fracture resistant. They're used in a lot of skin contacting devices. And, and they're photopolymers uh, that are actually UV sensitive photopolymers. And it uh, turns out they're relatively biocompatible. And you can polymerize them using two photon polymerization to create these sort of microneedle arrays, hollow microneedle arrays on a glass slide. Or, you could potentially create the whole base on which the microneedles reside, the bores on which the microneedles sit, and the microneedles themselves. And that's what we also did. And we could use that for a sort of delivery of a model drug into the skin. This is an example of delivering a quantum dot solution into to pig skin. And by putting uh, a microneedle through the skin, we could actually get drug, the, the quantum dot solution, into deeper layers. Whereas if you didn't have a microneedle, the, the, the quantum dot solution would just reside on the skin surface. You can start to uh, look at ways of integrating these with sensors also. And so we have looked over the past um, several years now at putting various sensors on the backside of two photon polymerization created microneedles. This is an example of a car force carbon electrode created through laser interference lithography modified for de detection of potassium ion. And in fact, uh, with this electrode, you could detect changes in potassium ion concentration. It was insensitive to addition of sodium ion. You can uh, put this electrode on the back side of a chip that features a two-photon polymerization created microneedle. And now you have a, a kind of a microscale device that can do this sort of 
um, potassium ion concentration studies uh, while dwelling on the skin. Here's an example of uh, this sort of microneedle in a little bit more detail. What you see here is again, you have a lot of control over the, the, the microneedle design. You have the ability to change um, the stage power, the, the voxel length, and you can control things like uh, uh, the voxel dimensions and the fabrication time. You can basically have multiple parameters you can adjust to get the structure that you like. You can also put more complex uh, patterns, uh, patterned electrodes at the back. This is an example of a, uh, an array that contains your working electrodes, counter electrode, and reference electrode. Um, you can see here that it also includes some microfluidics to transfer liquid from the microneedle to uh, the uh, electrode region. And in fact, you can use this to detect cardiac enzymes like myoglobin and troponin, which can, are, are relevant because their values are increased if someone has a heart attack. As you can see, there are some limitations in two-photon polymerization processing in terms of the processing rate. There are ways of trying to overcome that. One way that we looked at is an electromolding approach. So you do two-photon polymerization of a microneedle master. You do uh, silicone micromolding, you remove the, the mold, you deposit a seed layer, uh, and then you essentially remove that uh, sort of backing in order to create a, a metallic microneedle that uh, sort of retains the geometry and has the hollow features of the uh, two photon polymerization created master. And so this does have the unique ability to sort of start taking very complex features and then translate them to uh, metal microneedles that can be created relatively quickly. Um, here's an example of some of these um, electromolded microneedles. You can see here that they have the, the hollow tips. You can see here, uh, as you'd expect, because these are created from this sort of electroplated metal, they have um, much more flexibility than, than some of these two photon polymerization created structures. You can bend them, you can penetrate skin with them, you can then also reuse the molds, um, and you can start to deliver dye to skin with these, but you can also, of course, build sensors off of these. So that, that kind of took us through how we use two photon polymerization to kind of innovate in the tissue engineering scaffold, uh, sensor and drug delivery space. But there are limitations to photon polymerization, one of them being that the processing rates are relatively low, the throughput's relatively low. And we started also looking at other ways of making microneedles that could allow us to, to make more of them and, and thus have a more scalable uh, approach for producing microneedle arrays for, for this uh, sensor application. And we came across the digital micro-mirror device-based micro-material lithography. This approach allows you to, to polymerize material with much Kruger features in two-photon polymerization. So the layer height is 50 micrometers instead of down in the sub-micrometer regime. But you can make microneedles that penetrate pig skin. And you can, in fact, also use these, and this is an example of a live study uh, with pigs, and you can deliver drugs into um, the pig is using this sort of a uh, design. And in fact, we were able to get a radioactive uh, glucose into the pig with this. But we were really more interested in the sensor. So this is an example of a carbon paste electrode, uh, a glucose oxidase, I'm sorry, a lactate oxidase modified rhodium doped carbon paste that was mechanically entered within the hollow bores of microneedles. And so we, we could pack this into the, the hollow bores, then sand it, and you can create these sort of uh, interfaces where you have an electrode right inside uh, the, the, the tip, and so you don't have to deal with fluidic issues. You don't have to deal with fouling of the fluidics. And we looked at that for lactate detection. We were able to detect lactate in the physio over the physiologic range, and we were able to have uh, an electrode that wasn't affected by uh, uric acid, ascorbic acid, or acetaminophen, these sort of what we call interfering molecules. 
You can also do something else with this platform. You can put different microneedles in a microneedle array uh, on, on, in one of these microneedle arrays where each of the microneedles does something different. So it's, we call it a multiplex microneedle array. So each of the, the microneedles is, is, is detecting a different analyte. And so this is an example of where um, we had separate microneedles, one for detection of glucose, another for detection of lactate, a third for detection of pH in the microneedle array. And this is accomplished by uh, sort of extensive manipulation of the backside uh, platform in which these microneedles res reside. So you obviously uh, are still using the, the same sorts of apparatus, but it, you have to have each of these electrodes individually addressable uh, to the potentiostat. Um, so you're making different uh, openings with a, a laser, you're packing the carbon paste, but then you have um, different sites on the, the back which can be um, interrogated to get the, the, the data of interest from the individual microneedles. And what we were able to show is that we have uh, functioning sensors for pH uh, over the physiologic range, glucose over the physiologic range, and lactate over the physiologic range. We also showed that the lactate sensor was insensitive to addition of glucose, and the glucose sensor was insensitive to the changes in lactate. So this kind of shows one way going forward to try to increase the throughput for making these sorts of sensors. So to close out, I wanted to go back to 3D printing and what we see as challenges and where we see this technology going forward. You do have with the sort of customization approach, um, sort of a comparison to injection molding that has been documented by many people where essentially at, at some low volume of production, the 3D printing can be a lower cost per part. But at some point, and it can be different for each different type of part, the injection molding becomes the most cost effective option. And, and so, this will differ based on the part, the complexity of the part, various parameters, but we see, uh, based on the fact that this is somewhat um, universal or feature of 3D printing, that this, this sort of parameter or this limitation uh, kind of drives 3D printing towards uh, customized implants, customized sensors, customized drug delivery products. If you can make something uh, identical for 10,000 people, perhaps still conventional mechanisms are, are still the right way to go. There are other challenges. The question we have about whether um, any of the artifacts of processing affects the mechanical properties, whether any of the unprocessed material affects biocompatibility, these are still parameters we need to consider. We, we see, uh, in addition, other, other concerns the price of the printer remains high for many of these techniques. Um, you oftentimes will have uh, 3D printing bureaus where you have different types of printers for different applications. And this also complicates uh, the way of, in which we can commercialize 3D printing because it means that you have to have three times or four times the uh, infrastructure as you would with a conventional technique. But despite this, I think that there's still a lot of uh, power to 3D printing going forward. Uh, I think uh, as long as you start to manage the toxicities of these materials in the short and long term, as long as you create efforts to drive down the feedstock costs, the equipment costs, and increase throughput, this can be a viable approach for manufacturing medical products. And finally, I wanted to, to end with kind of a positive note about um, light-based, laser-based additive manufacturing in terms of throughput. I think that one of the limitations people see in uh, laser-based additive manufacturing, especially if you're creating microneedles or tissue engineering scaffolds, is just that you're, you only have one laser focus that's trying to, to process each voxel in order to create a 3D part. And that certainly does seem like an enormous limitation to, to, to large-scale production. But what you have with light is the ability to manipulate light in order to create um, a, a um, multiple beams. So through a, a hologram pattern, you can create multiple daughter beams that can 
uh, replicate the same features in parallel. And so this is an example of a microneedle array uh, that was created through a hologram pattern uh, approach whereby uh, you have one light source that through uh, this approach was created four daughter beams and the four daughter beams created nine of the microneedles each. And that allowed you to reduce the processing time quite significantly. And, and this perhaps allows one to get down to processing times that are, are uh, equivalent to those of um, photolithography or other microelectronics manufacturing techniques. So uh, that's all I have. I'd be glad to answer any of your questions. We have time for some questions. Dean? The real hassle is that um, with nearly all these printers you've got, you're told what material you have to use. You don't know what it is. You know, um, the, 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 you buy, have to buy a proprietary material. That's true. I think uh, for a lot of these systems, I think, for example, with a digital micromirror device system, you have a card and you have to only use the resins that are associated with that card. Mm -hmm. uh, for two photon polymerization, if you have a home built system, you can, you can build with any resin that you put into the system. So mm -hmm. that offers some uh, flexibility. One of the things you also have to look at is the light source. So uh, if you have an amplified light source, you can do the sort of um, hologram pattern approach and sort of reduce the, the processing time. If you have a fiber laser, which is a, a lower power laser, you have uh, limitations in terms of the resins you can use. So there are all sorts of hardware-based limitations to additive manufacturing with lasers that um, kind of drive people in various directions, whether it be a commercial system or a home-built system. But um, it, the maximum flexibility is, is with a home-built system with as many of these parameters sort of left open as possible. Yeah. Um, so, um, in terms of the uh, laser based additive manufacturing, yeah. are multiple materials compatible? Like, can you kill like, one material and then swap out the polymers out and put another material? Yes, so that would be a little bit complicated, but um, so in the conventional stereolithography approaches, even in the digital micromirror device stereolithography approach, you have a vat of material and you manipulate the stage, you lower the stage as you're building each layer in order to create the three-dimensional product. In the case of two-photon polymerization, you're actually polymerizing within the volume of the resin. So you're not manipulating the stage. You are translating the stage in three dimensions in order to create the part of interest, but you're not lowering the stage in, in this kind of conventional method that you're seeing with either um, a digital micromirror device-based mask, virtual mask, or with a, a laser-based approach for, for microsterolithography. So with two-photon polymerization, you could potentially cure whatever you need, put another resin in, and then just cure on top of it. With a, uh, the other approach, you potentially also could, could do these sorts of things. You also have to have software that kind of sort of allows you, well, it's the software and the hardware that allow you to stop and restart like that. Because one of the problems is when you try to remove resin, you're going to have micro translation or macro translation of that half built material in three dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to put it down right where you left it. So even if your software tells you that you want to stop and restart, uh, if, if, you're, if you have, don't have the ability to kind of move with the kind of ex exquisite ease in three dimensions to, to remove the, 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 the resin and then add new resin, it would be very hard to do that just as a practical matter. So how do you interface the micro needles with like uh, another chip? Do you just finish killing the micro needle first and then just transfer it? Over? Yeah. So right now what we do is uh, we the the larger parts are made through um, laser machining of conventional polymers. Mm -hmm. So uh, just um, these are conventionally made, not three D printed structures. You could create three D printed microfluidic channels and you could build the entire uh, sort of part with 3D printing, it would just take a much longer period of time. And one, one time we built a blood vessel just five millimeters long, so just a five millimeter tube, it took days 
And so the big problem we have is that if you want to do the entire structure, it would just be prohibitively long. That's why we focus on the thing where, where uh, the two-photon polymerization has the, the unique feature, which is to make these sharp tips with these sort of exquisite uh, geometries. I think that's where you, you take advantage of it. Try to make the kind of a, a flat sheet and with some small scale features, it could be easily done with another technique. Yeah. When you um, have your tape with the cells on there, yeah. you've got to first of all get culture this tape, right? So you get them all to stick on it. Yeah. But they're sticking on a substrate, and then your your laser's coming down from behind. Right. And melting it. They're, they're just literally falling off. Is that right? So what it is, I kind of simplified it just for the uh, purpose of a, a kind of a quick overview. So we, we actually will spin coat the cells in matrigel, which is sort of a cell nutrient contain uh, medium, which is created through uh, extracellular matrix of rats um, and that material so this is kind of a, uh, a protective material and uh, a friendly material to the cells um, you can then ablate that with a low fluence ideally your that interface between the the glass disk and this this uh, cell extracellular matrix construct is not a cell that interface ideally is this uh, this uh, matrix gel, and so then you're basically absorbing at that matrix cell matrix gel interface, and then based on the the laser fluids, you can move the, the cells deeper and deeper into the substrate, up to a level, up to uh, some up, upper maximum. So what's your measure for the cells retaining their viability? So this is just done with cell viability, um, oh, and, and so we, this is not a, a, a one of the things I, I show is that I kind of did a transition from biopolymer printing to cell printing to two-photon polymerization. I don't really spend a lot of time on cell printing for the reason that it's a very uh, fraught with this issue. Um, that if you're, if you're printing a cell, you're potentially transforming it in one way or another, whether it be inkjet printing or laser printing or other types of uh, uh, solenoid uh, actuation to, 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 to drop a cell. And that's one reason why I spend less time on that topic. I, I simply say this, these are kind of ways you can use a laser to, to print uh, various structures. But you're right, there are very complex studies you can do on, um, on, on laser transfer cells. I have a colleague at um, Tulane University, Doug Christie, who spends a lot of time looking at, at how to optimize the, uh, pro, the parameters of uh, maple DW printed cells. Those studies he has done in more recent years, I think, show that it could be used for in vitro cell testing. I don't think that you can ever say with certainty that this is not a cell that is, is identical to the as a received cell. That's the problem. That we, we just don't have enough uh, complexity in terms of the way in which we interrogate a cell to understand this. We, I have an a colleague who does a lot of thermal inkjet printing and, and after a long period of time they were able to sort of tease out uh, variations in cells that were inkjet printed versus as received and in all likelihood you will see that they're not identical after laser printing. We, you know, that's something where I've, I sort of examined it but I, there are other people examining it right now. They have little burns on them or something? <laughs> well, I mean, no. The thing is that they have some ideal, uh, they have cell proliferation rates that are similar to cells grown in polystyrene. So they're, the sort of crude studies we do show that they're, they're, they're functioning like normal cells. The only question is, what do you want to have this implanted within you? Yeah. And that's true for any of these techniques. That's even true for inkjet printing. That's true for, for solenoid-based uh, cell plotting. This is a big question. This is basically the, the, the question which is limited cell bioprinting. Is no one really knows whether these cells are transformed by the bioprinting process. It's a lot easier to play with the polymers because you don't have to deal with that. And so that's one reason why I've spent more time on that. But certainly, in order to advance cell printing, you have to finally kind of validate and, and kind of disprove that there are any changes in, after the printing technique. So one of the things you mentioned was uh, you know, trying to get the, the um, the, the scale of these uh, features down right. so from from the, maybe the 
uh, hundreds of microns to the sub-micron level. Right. And so what, what do you think uh, would make that possible? So there are a lot of ways you can reduce the size. So even with the polyethylene glycol diaclate, we can get the features down to 200 nanometers. You can do post-processing techniques to reduce the size even further. So you can do etching of like an ormister material and get just by etching the, the, the as-received material, the as-prepared material, you can get features down to 60 nanometers. You're never going to get something that, that equals what you get through um, photolithography approaches and conventional uh, microelectronic approaches, but you have the advantage of being able to create three dimensions without multiple steps. So it's a trade-off. Basically, you're going to get larger scale features, but you have the ability to do 3D in a single step. So it's just what you need for a given application. Uh, um, uh, <coughs> I've got a cell biology background. I'm struggling to think of an application where you want to go sub-micron. Like, you know, the average cell might be, say, 50 microns across, and the market need is really to assemble larger structures, right? not to make you know, tiny little ones. I think that's, so, a, that's a legitimate uh, question. Uh, and everybody wants to be able to reassemble with their, with their pluripotent um, stem cells, mini many organs that could go on a scaffold and so forth. So uh, isn't the rest of the field heading towards making bigger things and you're heading towards making smaller things, which I'm struggling to think of a direct application. I suppose you're not allowed to tell us what the naval folk are interested in. <laughs> no, no. Actually, I mean, for, for microneedle sensors, you, you have an advantage of being able to create smaller scale sensors. So that's one. But what's the advantage over photolithography? Because you haven't got the, the ability to scale the thing up to the same extent. That you well, have yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that maybe you could use this sort of multi, um, you can use this hologram pattern approach to try to increase the scale. I mean, you're right, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages to each technique. I'd say the reality is that for uh, tissue engineering scaffolds, you don't need submicrometer scale. For device applications, there are potential applications in the submicrometer scale that where if you can increase the amount of complexity in the device, you can add more sensors, you can uh, create interfaces that perhaps prevent fouling or have more functionality. But I mean, you, you were talking about a sensor that could measure, say, three or four um, things simultaneously. Right. Uh, I, I can see an advantage in that. Yeah. A single chip. Yeah. So, I, I, are, are you I, pursuing that? Yeah, that's, I think, where you see the advantage is that you can do this sort of uh, reduction in size and increase in, in functionality mm -hmm. with a device. I don't think that you can entirely disregard the advantage of trying to do small scale features with cells. I think people haven't studied it as much because the, you, you have a limitation in terms of the types of substrates that are available. You have typically these sort of photolithography manufactured 2D uh, small scale features. These can be 3D small scale features. So these can be, um, for example, uh, pillar arrays with very small scale features. And, and you could start to make different sorts of structures that are not necessarily com identical to the ones that people have been studying and, and have sort of ruled and or ruled out as, as substrates for, for tissue engineering. So there are potential future applications for, for tissue engineering or cell culture. The direct applications right now are for device manufacturing. I mean, perhaps some of the, um, the applications there would be to create these kind of micro domains for uh, promoting you know, cell addition or to pattern different kinds of uh, ECMs uh, on substrates where, where you might need uh, some micron resolution. Yeah, I think one of the things is something like that. You could easily tune a modulus of a surface by increasing or decreasing the density of, of a structure and, and thus you could have surfaces with different modulus that interact in a differential manner with cells. You could, you could play with the physical mechanical uh, parameters directly, and then you could, by post-processing, manipulate the chemical properties as well. So it just depends on, I mean, you, the things that, like you're describing are basically trying to understand the fundamental properties of cells. So we, we do have some efforts to, to start to look at that. It is difficult to interrogate small numbers of cells. So you have to basically interrogate them through microscopic examination, and that's not a, as quantitative a mechanism to understand cell behavior. So you can get a lot of qualitative data on these sorts of small scale features, but if it's not going to spread over the entire well plate, 
then you're, you're losing out on being able to, to get some statistics that you'd like to get. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question about your um, previous slide about the SLM method to yeah. parallelize the um, fabrication process. Yeah. So what's the fundamental limitation of that? Because you, you're sending a possibly micron size femtosecond beam, yeah. you're sending it to the liquid crystal and you're splitting it up. So each yeah. different spot has a lower intensity than the starting beam. Yeah, so you need an amplified beam. Right. But and would there be a limit in the liquid, like the liquid crystal and silica in SLM, for example? Yeah, there. I, I that's something we haven't fully examined. I think we have one setup where we were able to show this approach. But you're right, there are thresholds in terms of the laser and with the SLM that can create upper limits to this approach. I think we have not fully examined the. We basically in that paper we only showed reduction in fabrication time. We didn't try to to tease out the upper limits of the approach. But you're right, there are upper limits to the light source and to the to the hardware. All right, so um, let's uh, uh, thank Roger again for a very interesting talk. And please join us for some refreshments to continue the, the discussion until Roger has to run off the airport in about half an hour, I think. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Roger. Thank you.